right, let me welcome everybody again. Um, well, a few of you, but I met with uh, Brother Nathan Smoot, who's a missionary up here in Alaska. He's doing mission work out in Chattanooga, Steve's Highway, and out in the Circle. Uh, he just said to pass on his love to the church here and appreciation for the support. Um, the, the work there is continuing to go along well. And he gave me a, a, his quarterly missionary letter, which basically just briefed us on himself a couple of weeks ago, so there's not really anything <laughs> terribly new in there that he hasn't already said. Um, but he'll have a new letter that's coming to us here in the next couple of weeks. So um, I'll leave that up here, and anybody that's interested in reading through that can. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4 tonight. 1 John chapter 4, we're coming right to the end of this chapter. We'll finish out the last five verses in our study this evening. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. I want to remind you that there is a lengthy portion of Scripture from early in chapter 4 through about the midpoint of chapter 5. It's dealing with the uh, kind of a continuation of the same topic. And I'll reference that here just in, in a minute just to bring continuity to our study. First John chapter 4 and verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Let's bow and ask God's blessing on our study time. Our Father, we bow our hearts before you and recognize that if any good application is going to be done, um, it'll be done by you. And so I pray that, that you'll work through the words that are spoken this evening in accordance with your word, with your perfect word, and that you drive home the points and the application to our hearts in a very personal way. I pray that you'll challenge us through this. And be able to have absolute confidence before you as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, of all the important matters in life that we could talk about, none, absolutely none, is more vital than the one that John mentions in verse 17 here. Having boldness or having confidence in the day of judgment. Can you imagine anything that's more important than that? Is there anybody here who would want to stand before God Almighty on Judgment Day and not be absolutely positive of your standing before God? Anybody want to be there? I think you'd be crazy to have to uh, have a desire to think that way. Many millions of people do think that way, but they don't have to. So not only is it important to have confidence in the day of the judgment, but we have to make sure that our confidence is rooted in biblical reasons and not on some subjective hope. Polls among Americans today show that about 60% believe in hell in some form or another, but only about 4% think that there's a good chance that they'll go there. Now, since we're talking about eternity in the lake of fire, you need to be sure where you stand. You need to have confidence, and as John puts it here, you need to have boldness as you stand before God. Since John tells us how to have confidence on that coming day, we should all pay very close attention to this scripture this evening. Remember, this entire book, this entire letter from John these churches that are scattered throughout Asia Minor, the entire book is about authentic Christianity and how to measure yourself in three different primary ways to make sure that you are an authentic believer. In the context tonight, John is giving his final thoughts on the test of love for the brethren, or just love in general, the three tests that we've talked about and seen this theme, this recurring theme of throughout the book, are the moral test of obedience to God's commands that should characterize the life of a believer. 
the social test of biblical love for others and the doctrinal test of believing the truth. Those three primary areas are addressed multiple times by John in different, from different angles to really drive these points home. And so tonight John's giving his final thoughts on this test of biblical love. Back in chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, John makes the point that we must love one another because God is love, and he showed it by sending his son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins. In verses 12 through 16, John says that we can be assured that God abides in us and we abide in him if we see his spirit producing in us love for one another and a confession about the truth of Jesus Christ. And so he's kind of, he's already gone through this and he's built this in a significant amount of detail, but John knows that in the matter of loving other people, it's easy to be hypocrites. It's really easy for us to sing the hymn, Oh, How I Love Jesus, that we sang this evening, while at the same time, our homes are a war zone. We put on our spiritual masks when we come together at church or when we're around one another, but in our hearts, we harbor bitterness towards a person who's wronged us. Or we're only half-hearted in our surrender to the Lord. And so John once more hits this vital matter of practical love for one another, and he just continues to build this theme in saying that love that comes from God himself, it originates with God. It gives us confidence in the day of judgment, and it must be expressed in love for others in obedience to God's commandments. Now, by uh, it's fascinating to you, by, by linking this concept of biblical love to having confidence on the day of judgment, John shows how critically important it is that we learn practically to love one another. Not to be concerned about loving the brethren and not to be concerned about whether I am dwelling in love or not, biblical love that is, is to misunderstand my whole purpose of salvation. And as a result, it's really just to flout God's love towards me. If this concept that we're talking about this evening and throughout the theme of this book is not the greatest concern of my life, then I'm just a beginner at best in the Christian life, selfishly focusing on myself and my desires and remaining stagnant in spiritual immaturity and apathy. Folks, we can't stop at that point. The hallmark of the saints throughout the ages is their great increasing concern about the element of biblical love in their lives. That's what's always characterized genuine believers in the Lord. Well, John's flow of thought here through the verses that we're going to look at tonight doesn't take a whole lot of effort to follow. It's very logical in its progression. In verse 17, he starts out with the very first word. He says, herein. That refers back to the last half of verse 16, which tells us that God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. By abiding in God and his love, he says, our love is made perfect. The result of this perfected love, which I'm going to describe to you in just a minute here, is that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. The basis for that confidence in the day of judgment is our conformity to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 18, John gives the negative side of things. If we fear the day of judgment, it's evidence that we have not loved others as God intends. His love is not perfected in us. Now, lest we become proud, thinking that we can somehow do this in any way on our own, John goes on to show in verse 19 that God, once again, is the source of all biblical love. Unless we fall into the hypocrisy of saying that we love God, when in fact we don't practice love for one another, John shows in verse 20 that the test of whether we truly love God is our love for one another. And it kind of just keeps coming back full circle. He concludes in verse 21, 
by showing that the kind of biblical love that gives us confidence in the day of judgment is not just a nice, frilly suggestion. Rather, it is God's commandment. And so, let's break that down a little bit this evening. We're going to talk, first of all, about this. First point is that practicing the love of Christ gives us confidence in the day of judgment. That's how he leads into this, um, this thought tonight in verse 17. Once again, he says this. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Well, John makes um, about four points here that I'm going to walk through really quick in verses 17 and 18. First of all, and very obviously through what he states, there will be a day of judgment, and it is essential to have biblically-based confidence as you face that day. From beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is abundantly clear that there is coming a day of judgment. Jesus often spoke about the judgment to come. The Apostle Paul, preaching to the philosophers in Athens, declared that God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. He's speaking about Jesus Christ. Whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. He says almost something very parallel to what John says here. There is coming a day of judgment. It is appointed. God has a date set on his calendar, and God has given assurance to all people. We can have absolute confidence and assurance in the fact that Jesus rose from the grave, and so we put our confidence in that. When, um, when Paul reasoned with the Roman governor Felix, he discussed righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Now, Folks, we ought to understand, and I think we all probably do, that death, um, which is common to all people, everybody here is going to experience it unless the Lord returns and raptures us, but death, which is common to all people, is a judgment for our sin, but it's not the final judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 declares to us that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. And Hebrews goes on to describe that as in these words a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries in revelation john calls this the second death resulting in the lake of fire now we could talk tonight about all the horror hell but any way you examine it you don't want to experience that for all eternity you and I need at any cost to have a biblically-based confidence as we face that certain day. And so John shows us here one such basis for that confidence. He says one basis for confidence in the day of judgment is if we can see the fruit of God's love flowing through us to others. Now John's emphasis here um, is on love being perfected in us. That's the verbiage that he uses a number of times through this passage of Scripture. He first used that phrase in this book back in chapter 2 and verse 5 where he said this, Whoso keepeth his word, in him verily or truly is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. It is a sure proof. He used that phrase again in chapter 4 and verse 12. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. In chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, John elaborates on the first part of that statement where he says, if we love one another, God dwells in us. And so he's, he's capturing that, right? He repeated the concept of God's abiding in us and we abiding in him three times in that portion of Scripture. And now in verses 17 and 18, he repeats, Three times the concept of perfect love or love being perfected. So what does he mean by that? You might have heard this verse quoted um, 99 out of 100 times or maybe 100 out of 100 times out of context. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And people don't have any idea what they're talking about or what John's context was in saying that. Well, the Greek word 
that's translated perfect does not mean like in English to be without any flaws or shortcomings. That's not what it's talking about. The idea is to reach its complete development or its intended goal or to grow to maturity. There's a helpful reference that, that's very similar to this in James chapter 2 and verse 22. It uses some of the same verbiage. It says, um, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. Well, James is talking there and he means that works complete faith or they bring faith to its intended objective or to its goal. It demonstrates and shows it. So when John talks about God's love being perfected in us, he means that God's love has reached its intended goal in our lives. Perfect love. Perfect love is not just nice thoughts or words, but it's action. We're talking about God's love being put into action and accomplishing its objective. It doesn't remain at the mere stage of uh, or the imperfect stage of just simple talk, but it reaches the stage of action. It doesn't remain stagnant and the same. It does not stay immature. So John's saying that when we see God's love flowing through us to others in the way that's described in this book, and we've studied this for weeks now, so I'm not trying to just beat a dead horse, but when we see God's love flowing through us to others in the way that's described here, that is one basis for confidence in the day of judgment. In this regard, he's saying essentially the same thing that he said in chapter 3 and verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. The presence of God's love in your life, in my life, not just in words, but in deeds, is evidence that his life is in you. And you are in him. That's also what John meant in verse 12 of this chapter when he said, If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, understand, that doesn't mean that you always love everyone perfectly. Without any shortcomings. Nobody does that. But rather it means that the direction of your life as a believer in Christ is growth in love, and not just humanly explainable love, but rather God's love, which is defined in this book for us very clearly as a self-sacrificing, caring commitment <clears throat> that shows itself in seeking the highest benefit of the person who is loved. What is the highest benefit? What is the highest good that we're seeking for others? It is that people come to know salvation through Jesus Christ and be conformed to his image. That's Christ's example of love. And that's what's defined for us here that we are to also mirror. Well, this implies, folks, if you are reflecting and growing in this kind of love for other people, it implies that you're involved in close relationships with other believers where you are committed to work through misunderstandings and you're committed to work through hurt feelings. Hopefully you're committed to not getting hurt feelings in the first place because there's some maturity to you. I talk to people all the time who are struggling in their Christian walk, just struggling. Almost always I discover that they don't know any other believers well enough to meet regularly and help them work through their problems. To love one another, we have to get to know one another. That's what we naturally ought to be doing if our church is functioning in a healthy way. And it's also to be committed to work through difficulties in our relationships. When you see that kind of love increasing in your life, it gives you confidence in the day of judgment. That's God's love that you're seeing there. John goes on to explain why this is so. And he explains that God's love through us to other people gives confidence in judge, on Judgment Day because it shows that we're like Jesus Christ. That's really the key. At the end of verse 17, he added this little phrase. Maybe uh, you scratched your head about it when we read through it. But he says, 
because we can have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. What brings boldness and confidence at the judgment? Being like Christ. At judgment day, God is not going to get, condemn people who are like his son. Living a life of active biblical love shows that we have the spirit of Jesus Christ abiding in us. It shows that we belong to the family of God. And that gives us confidence before him. Now, on the flip side, you cannot live at odds with the character of Jesus and then expect to have any confidence at all when you stand before his Father on Judgment Day. And note that John um, does not say, as he is, so should we be. But he says, as he is, so are we in this world. It's a definite thing that has transpired. Now, each one of us needs to ask this question. Am I at all like Jesus? Does my life display any resemblance to the love of Jesus in this world? Would other people, especially those who live close to me, family members, co-workers, church members, would they say that they see the love of Christ in my daily behavior? As I said, we need to understand that um, that our love won't ever be an exact representation of Christ's love. Even in the godliest of saints, we're afflicted by sin. Every one of us, no matter how mature, love is also a fruit of the Spirit. And fruit takes time to mature and grow, doesn't it? And so we don't expect absolute perfection from a person as soon as they bow their knee to Jesus Christ. But if there's no evidence that there is fruit that is growing, then we need to examine the roots Find out the whole tree is bad. Oftentimes it is. Jesus said this, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. If you're not growing in love, you need to ask the question, am I truly born of God? Well, John goes on to examine the negative side of things here in verse 18. He tells us very clearly that if we fear the day of judgment, if we're fearful of judgment day, it's evidence that we've not loved others as God intends because we're not like Christ. And so he says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. John's not saying that we shouldn't fear God in the sense of regarding him with respect and reverence. Told all through the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, that we ought to fear God in that sense. It's not terror as we stand before him at the judgment, though. There is a proper sense of fearing God as the judge. Speaking in the context of the final judgment, Jesus said this, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. But in our text here, John means that you cannot draw near to God in love and then run from him out of fear of judgment at the same time. Those are two polarizing behaviors. John wants, or God wants his children to know that there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's a blessed, blessed promise. Now the phrase that he uses again, over and over, he talks about perfect love. As we've seen, it means that love has reached its goal, it's accomplished its purpose. If you still fear God's judgment, at the very least, we can say that you're not practicing biblical love for others as you should be doing. That's what John means when he says this. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, all of us, folks, all of us 
at one point in life should have experienced the fear of God's judgment. There's not a soul in this room today that professes to be saved that should not have at some given point in time that you shouldn't have had some fear, very real fear and terror of God's judgment. That is what brings a person to his or her knees in repentance, seeking God's mercy through faith in Christ. But as you grow in grace and as you grow in godliness, if your life is operating right and you're being instructed properly, that fear ought to be replaced by biblical love. There's one writer that put it this way. <clears throat> the proper course of growth in the spiritual life can be depicted thus. Like how he says this. At the, at the bottom level, he says, neither love nor fear. Then fear without love. And then both fear and love. And finally, love without fear. It's a course of growth that he's depicting there. Now, most unbelievers have neither the fear of God nor the love of God in their lives. They don't comprehend either one. Often that lack for lack of fear stems from ignorance. They haven't been brought the law of God and seen the judgment of God that's upon their lives. You know, often as you're raising children, children are unafraid of danger, completely fearless because they're not aware of the severity of the danger that's in front of them. That's something that has to be taught. They have to be exposed to it. Concerning people in their natural state, Paul says this in Romans 3.18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the natural man. Unbelievers are a heartbeat away from eternity in the lake of fire, but they don't fear God. But then, as the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin and judgment, they rightfully become terrified of God's wrath. And they're guilty before him. Now, at that, at this point, it's fear without love. They don't have a, a comprehension of God's love yet. And God uses that fear to drive them to the cross. So they stand trembling appropriately, and then they experience both fear and the love of God. And then as they grow assured of God's grace, and they see biblical love that starts to work itself out in their lives, they cast out fear, and they grow into love without fear. John Newton, in his song, Amazing Grace, that we sung tonight, put it this way. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." So John's point here is that God's love grows, or as God's love grows in your life, it casts out fear of judgment that existed before. God's love flowing through you is evidence that you are born of God, and that evidence removes the fear of God's judgment. But John knows that it's really easy to get puffed up with pride, or to fall into hypocrisy or excuses when it comes to the practical matter of loving others. And so he addresses these problems in the last three verses of this chapter. Verses 19 through 21, once again, he says, we love him because he first loved us. We don't generate this love ourselves. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. And he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Well, the, the second main point that I want to make tonight is found here, and that is that love that gives us confidence in the day of judgment comes from God himself, and it must be expressed in love for others in obedience to God's commandment. So John makes three sub-points here within this. First of all, love that gives us confidence in the day of judgment comes from God. Right? We see that in verse 19. We love. Why? Why do we love? Why are we capable of loving in a biblical way? Because he first loved us. That's where it begins. John's point in the context is that, is that if we love God or others to any extent with genuine biblical love, we have to remember that that did not originate with us. 
It came from God, who loved us while we were yet sinners. It's evidence that we've experienced his love in a saving way when we experience that in our lives, and we reflect that to other people. Now, one practical application of verse 19 is, if you are struggling to love someone, especially someone who's wronged you, Friend, meditate on God's love as it was shown to you at the cross. You didn't deserve it in any way. On the contrary, you deserve God's wrath and God's judgment. But in spite of all your sins, in spite of all your shortcomings and failures, Jesus willingly suffered the penalty that you and I should have received. And now his direction is that we be the channel of his love to other sinners. But it's easy to deceive ourselves into thinking that we love God when in fact we don't. And so John continues and says, secondly, that love that gives us confidence in the day of judgment is validated, it is verified, it is demonstrated by our love for one another. And so in verse 20, as usual, John doesn't mince words at all. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? It's interesting to me to see how John builds these concepts, but you know, he uses the word liar with reference to each of the three tests that we talked about. With regard to the test of obedience to God's commands, he said in chapter 2 and verse 4, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. With regard to the purity and doctrine test, he said in chapter 2 and verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? And here he applies it to the test of biblical love. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. He's come back to that theme three times, folks. No matter how loudly we affirm ourselves to be Christians, habitual sin, denial of pure biblical doctrine, and selfishness that's expressed through a lack of biblical love exposes us as the liars that we are. Now John's argument is that we cannot separate the two great commandments. It's easier to say, I love God, because God's invisible, and love for him can be really difficult to observe and measure. Anybody can say, I love God. But how do you measure that? But Jesus said this, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And what was his main commandment? Do you remember when, when the, the guy came to him and asked him that? What's the great commandment in the law? He said, thou shalt... Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it. It is a mirror image of it. It's going to naturally be shown. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? Those are the two great commandments that he talked about that summarize and epitomize all the moral law of God. John is saying that genuine love for God necessarily will show itself in an observable love for others. If you don't practice sacrificial, committed love for others, you're revealing that you don't really love God. Because it is the most natural thing possible in this universe for a person who's been converted and become like Christ to actually act like Christ. But John's not done here. He knows that it's really easy to make up excuses for our lack of love. Well, I've tried, but this person is just impossible to love. <laughs> if you knew how difficult this person really was, you'd understand why I don't love him or her as much. Well, he shows this. Love that gives us confidence in the day of judgment is God's commandment. It's not just a nice suggestion. Verse 21, the last verse in the chapter he says, this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. The Bible calls loving the Lord with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself the two great commandments. 
Not the two great suggestions. If maybe you'd like to just give it a try sometime. John reminds us that the commandment came directly from God. That means that we're not free to just shrug it off if we claim to be Christians. The fact that love can be commanded, once again, shows that it's not primarily a feeling, although it certainly is accompanied by emotion and feeling at times. It is primarily an action. It is a caring, I'm going to keep beating this into everybody's heads, it is a caring, self-sacrificing commitment that shows itself in seeking the highest good of the person that you're loving by God's grace. And in dependence on the Holy Spirit, you can and must practice that kind of love even towards those who are difficult and seemingly impossible to love. Our hearts should always burn with a holy passion to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people no matter how wicked they are. And to continue to demonstrate to and challenge God's people to be conformed to the image of Christ. The fact that God commands us to love also shows that it's not always effortless and it's not always easy. You know, if love just gushed out of us like some kind of a, a mountain spring, John probably wouldn't have labored the point as much as he did. Some of you have experienced deep wounds from those who profess to be Christians. I'm not saying that loving them will be easy, but I am saying that loving them is not optional. God gave us this commandment, and he didn't attach a list of exceptions for difficult cases. There was an 11-year-old girl and her eight-year-old brother who fought over everything, everything. And so their father was surprised when the girl made an artistic card for her brother's birthday. And inside she wrote this. Happy birthday to my nine-year-old brother. I am so glad to have a brother to love. So God gave me you. P.S. Don't read this out loud or I will twist your head off. <laughs> well, she's got a little ways to go. But at least she's working at loving her brother. I encourage you to work at it with those you live with and work at it with those in this church. Remember, the payoff for obedience to this command, folks, is that it will give you a sure confidence before God in the day of judgment. Now, our primary source of confidence is that we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood as the propitiation for our sins. It is only his blood, not our works, that atones for our sin. But how do we know that our faith in Christ is genuine, since it's so easy to be deceived? John was writing to people who there were all kinds of runs at these people to deceive them by false teachers. Well, he demonstrates to them that one evidence of genuine faith is when we see God's genuine biblical love that's flowing through us to others, especially to others that we would not naturally love. The more you see God's love surfacing in your life, the more you will have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And that ties right back to chapter 2 and verse 28 where he made that very statement. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to open your word this evening, and I thank you for the very simplistic truths that you've broken down for us here in your word. I thank you that you give us these clear and easy-to-understand tests of what it is to be an authentic Christian and, and ultimately continue over and over to point out uh, the critical matter of believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior but I thank you also that you give us some tangible proofs that we can look at and measure our own lives by to see whether we're authentic believers. And so as we wrap up this fourth chapter of 1 John, as we wrap up um, largely this, this uh, concept about loving one another uh, in a biblical way as being one of the, um, the tests that you give us for, for whether we're saved, I pray that
you'll make clear application to all of our hearts. Lord, um, we've seen the definition of love from the scriptures now, and we understand more fully. I, I understand more fully that it has to do with, with loving people in the way that you define it, which is sending your son to be the savior for their sins. And we know that that's the greatest way that we can express love to others is by upholding the truth of the gospel and then upholding the truth of your word to them. So help us to genuinely love in that way. And I pray that as, uh, as our lives grow in that fashion and as we see that type of biblical love being demonstrated, that it'll give us rock solid confidence as we serve you, um, that we know where we're going and that at the judgment we have no reason to fear at all. In fact, we should be moved in terror by the judgment as we think about others that will experience that and our need to bring the gospel to them so they can be saved from it. Thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for our, our church and the opportunity to gather together. We pray for, um, for great min uh, ministry opportunities in this coming year to share this love with others, to bless our community. We pray for our church members who who are away from us tonight and ask that you'll care for them and uphold them be walking with them today in jesus name amen, amen.